history. So he, he came to be called America's Plato because he was a sort of first homegrown philosopher. But I, I think of him as America's Shankaracharya because if you read Emerson and you understand the English of his day, he's, he's Advaita Vedanta. Closer to the mic. I have to lean in, okay. Um, he, his, he was expressing Advaita Vedanta in the 19th century English of American prose. And it's not an accident because he was absorbing Vedantic ideas through the Gita and other texts that he wrote and his own intuitive insights into the way things are. He gave his copy of the Gita to Thoreau when Thoreau famously spent his sojourn on the pond in Walden and wrote his famous text, Walden, which almost every American high school or college student reads at one point. And in it, he calls himself a yogi. And I always like to reflect on the fact that within a 10 mile radius of Walden Pond in Massachusetts, now there's probably 200 yoga studios or 100 or whatever. There weren't any then. There were no gurus then. There was nothing except books. But he saw something and called himself a yogi. And he, write a, he wrote about reading the Gita every morning and what a sublime text it was and how important it was in his own thinking. Millions of American young people read that and they get inspired and they go and find a copy of the Gita themselves and it, for many of them that's the beginning of a new way of looking at the world and a new spirituality. That has been going on now for more than 150 years. But it, there's this little interaction that I was reminded of when I was in uh, Ahmedabad the other day and went to the Gandhi ashram. India influenced Henry David Thoreau through the Gita. Thoreau influenced Gandhi through his work in the the ideas of nonviolent protest and civil disobedience. And Gandhi, in turn, this is, these are three Time magazine covers from the 1930s. Gandhi's um, voice in the world and his presence in the world was one of those factors that got Americans to start thinking India wasn't just some backward country in Asia, uh, but had something of importance in the world and something to pay attention to. And Gandhi, went on to influence a lot of Americans, most especially Martin Luther King, who is pictured here, arriving in India in 1959 on a sort of pilgrimage to Gandhi's ashrams and to uh, explore further Gandhi's work. And he would then put that into uh, action in his uh, civil rights campaign to end racism in America. So we have had a fruitful relationship through these sort of giants of history. But there's much more to it than that. We all know what India has adopted from America. It's obvious on the streets. We invented automobiles. You have traffic jams. <laughs> and I, ever since I got here, I've been thinking, we should have left the horns out of the cars when we sent them to India. <laughs> uh, we invented you know, movie technology, you have Bollywood, and now Bollywood dance and music is popular with young Americans in nightclubs. And television and you know, cell phones and you know, all those technological advances that America um, 
instigated and <clears throat> gave to the world. We won't mention some of the other things that are not worthy of your adopting, but ever since I got here, <laughs> and people have said, oh, our young people, they're turning to America, and I thought, oh my God, I hope they don't adopt the wrong things, you know? Cell phones are good, Coca-Cola is not. <laughs> and fast food and all that junk. Be discerning about what you borrow from America. Um, but those gifts of America to the world, those technological advances, the, the machinery of material progress that has genuinely helped many countries, and I'm sure India, um, what we've gotten in return from India is, is far less visible. It's, it's the life of the spirit. It, it's, it's, it's knowledge and technologies that transform inner life, that affect the mind and the heart and the soul. It's not so visible. Yoga asanas are visible. And they're so visible now in America, you can't see a magazine without some pictures of people doing asanas or you know, look at a TV commercial. But, but, for the most, but what the real value of what India gave us is in the realm of, of knowledge and ideas and practical uh, mind and body technologies of yoga. And what, and what mainly came to America of all the great uh, diverse uh, multifaceted teachings of Sanatana Dharma was the central ideas of Vedanta, primarily you know, the sort of modern Vedanta that uh, Swami Vivekananda articulated so well and gave to set the template for that sort of transmission from India to the West and the, the, the practical methodologies of yoga. That combination is um, primarily what we've absorbed uh, from, from the Vedic tradition. And now, and I'll get to this later, now we're starting to appreciate some of the other aspects of the Dharma that w w most Americans would not have been ready to uh, accept 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. But now things are changing and we know a lot and we want to know more. The, that transmission and the uh, eagerness with which certain Americans embraced Vedanta and yoga and over time were in turn transmitted to other Americans, eventually started to have a transformative effect on, on American life. It has changed the discipline of psychology in a significant way. It has changed medicine, healthcare modalities. It has changed even the way some of our theoretical physicists look at the world and the universe. It has changed the way the sort of leaders in the field of how to improve your life. I, we have a huge self-help industry in America. And most of the leading figures in that have, you know, back in the 60s and 70s when the interest in India exploded, and people of my generation were going to see gurus and coming to ashrams. Most of the leaders in that field have absorbed to some degree or another ideas from Vedanta and methods of yoga and they translate it into the language of self-improvement and remove the sort of religious overtones that could be read into it if they use Sanskrit or any, any giveaways. And, those ideas filter in through people who just want advice about how to have a happier life or 
lose weight or have a more successful business. But mostly it has changed how Americans understand religion and what religion can be. Not what religion is, but what religion can be and what it means to have a, a deep and authentic spiritual life. This has been a radical shift. A few years ago, as I was finishing American Veda and uh, trying to cut it down to a mere 350 pages, um, <clears throat> an article was published in Newsweek magazine written by the uh, religion editor. Newsweek then was the most important weekly news magazine in the country. And the headline of that article was, we are all Hindus now. <clears throat> you can imagine what that title, uh, how, how people reacted to that title. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun, actually, to see the reactions to it. Um, and the first line of the article was even more provocative because it said, America is not a Christian nation. And that came as a shock to certain American faction of Americans who um, not only want America to be a Christian nation, but want the world to be a Christian world. And not just any Christian world, their form of Christian world, not that church's Christian world, but our form of church. And we have those people in America, as you know, because they're funding people here doing horrible things in the name of missionary work. And I, you know, and I, I'm conscious of the fact that this is being videotaped. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that I could start, if this gets on YouTube or something, I could get <clears throat> even more angry emails, but I don't care because that, that I, the stories I hear just make me very upset. And we, we could talk more about that later. But anyway, the, the point is that um, it came as a, what does she mean where we are all Hindus now? Well, what she didn't mean was that massive numbers of Americans were going to stop going to church and synagogue and go to mandirs instead. She didn't mean that you know, Christians were going to you know, tear down <laughs> their statues of Jesus and rip the crosses off their neck and replace them with uh, murtis and, and uh, you know, medallions of uh, Ganesha or something. They weren't going to start doing pujas in their home instead of you know, praying in their usual way. What she meant was, in the first sentence, recent poll, the second sentence, recent poll data show that conceptually, we are slowly becoming more like Hindus and less like traditional Christians in the ways we think about God, ourselves, each other, and eternity. Now, that was very perceptive of that editor. I just spent a few years researching and writing American Veda, and I had come to a similar conclusion. And in fact, I had even a lot more data than she did. But she saw the scientific evidence because in America we do surveys every once in a while about how people feel about religion and spirituality and how they practice their spirituality, what their uh, values are in that realm. And if you look at the body of data, and I investigated it because I wanted to make sure my, uh, my sense that this America was changing in this way, I could back up with uh, facts, um, <clears throat> I saw trends over the course of 20, 30, 40 years. And it shows that in spirit, it, it, Americans 
philosophically, theologically, have become a nation of Vedantins, in a sense. That includes millions of people who had never heard the word Vedanta in their lives. I gave a talk at one of the conferences celebrating Vivekananda's 150th birth celebration, and I said there's millions of Americans who have been powerfully affected by Vivekananda and his legacy who never heard of him. They don't even know he, who he was. They don't know what Vedanta is. They've never heard, uh, you know, the Mahavakyas that is part of your you know, DNA. But they've heard it <clears throat> translated into ordinary English by a psychologist or a professor or a scholar or someone on television or Oprah Winfrey or, you know, Dr. So-and-so. And the ideas ring true and, and it's started to change them. And in practice, you can see, we're becoming a nation of yogis. There's a, and there's 20 million people a year in America who take yoga classes, which usually means just you know asanas and you know little pranayam. But in, I don't mean just them. There's another 40 or 50 million estimated people who have some kind of meditation practice. Many of those people are not practicing a form that is directly Hindu or Buddhist. It may be very secular form, but they wouldn't even have the idea of sitting down in something called meditation if it weren't for the teachings and teachers who came to us from India. It was just not part of the American spiritual language until the last few decades. I'm going to, this is a kind of summary of 